Hi all, happy Monday. Welcome to The Wife of Caesar. My name is Michelle Levien, or Michelle Levien, either is fine. As you know, The Wife of Caesar is Steiner's project to talk about corruption or anti-corruption using regular words so that we can fight corruption in our daily lives with a little bit more than just good intentions. Okay, as in every show, we will have a piece of news, a case, and a typology, all dealing with corruption, all dealing with, with anti-corruption, and we will give you our particular take on everything. Today's news deals with Transparency International and their release of the document titled Global Corruption Barometer, Latin America and the Caribbean. As you know, um, TI, Transparency International or TI, is an NGO, an international NGO that is devoted to fighting corruption around the world through its uh, main chapter or through its individual country chapters. Now, they do... Uh, they do this via activism and by doing research and uh, surveys. Um, they essentially function as a think tank. And their most recent survey, which was released today, maybe two, three hours ago, is the Global Corruption Bar Barometer for Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, this is part of a series of different global corruption barometers. And what they do is each, each of them is a study based on a survey. They do surveys, uh, they survey people from different countries of particular regions, in this case Latin America and Caribbean, and they, they use different questions that might help TI figure out the, the current trends, the ongoing trends in that particular region vis-a-vis -vis corruption. Now what happened here is they did a survey uh, that lasted from January to May of 2019, so this year and very recent, recently. They surveyed around 17,000 people uh, throughout uh, 18 different countries and they used uh, either um, organiza organizations or commercial companies that, that are devoted to, uh, to doing surveys and polls. Uh, the people polled, were the, the only requirement was that they were over 18 years, years of age. Now, what are the results? The document is quite extensive. It's about 60 pages, and full disclosure, we have not read all of it. We only read the main points and the summarized offered by TI, and herein we give you our personal uh, super summarized version. Okay, now the results are that people in Latin America, in these 18 countries, uh, found that corruption grew. There is more corruption in these countries. Big surprise. Not really. It is, it is however, contrasting with how, um, how much the words fighting against corruption have been in the news and have been in the discourse of local government. They talk about it a lot, but they don't seem to be doing, it, to be doing much about it. Now, uh, people also found that the fight against corruption is flawed. The governments are not doing as much as they could be doing, even though in the discourse, in the public discourse and political discourse, they talk about fighting corruption all the time. Now, this is an issue because a lot of populist leaders have exploited this notion of the fight against corruption and have used it as their flagship to launch their political platform. During campaigns, they talk a lot about fighting corruption, but again, people feel or have the general idea that corruption is still growing. So politicians lying, big surprise. Now, most people polled um, were of the opinion that high-ranking officials are the worst, specifically elected officials. So it's, again, it's kind of uh, contrasting or it's, it's uh, surprising that we find that the people that we ourselves elect to government turn out to be the worst. We're talking about uh, positions in elected office. Okay, they also found that bribery uh, bribe is king, is the king of the corrupt acts. About one-fifth of people, that's 25%, no, that's 20% paid bribes for basic services that they should, they are, they are already entitled to receive from the government, like healthcare, education, water, and other types of services like maybe electricity, things like that. Now, the issue here is we tend to think uh, of the people that pay bribes to get a government service as corrupt themselves. But if you think about it, if you have a government agency that is extracting money from you for something that you already have the right to receive, then you might not be the corrupt party in this equation. It probably is uh, much more likely that your government is extorting you and your public, public officials are the corrupt ones. This is very interesting. Um, this is very new. It's unprecedented. 
uh, the survey found that one fifth of people, one in five people have been uh, the victim of or know someone who has been the victim of sexual extortion. That is a form of corruption that instead of extracting money from the victim, extracts from them sexual favors. And that will be more relevant when we talk about the recommendations. And last but not least, one in every four people um, were involved or somehow related in vote buying. Um, the corrupt practice of paying a bribe to someone to sway their vote. In light of this, then, it is no surprise that corruption is growing and that, specifically, high-ranking officials are the worst offenders. If you have someone who is highly vulnerable, poor people living, living in poverty, and you uh, exploit that poverty or that vulnerability to sway their votes because you offer them money that they don't have access to, then it's very obvious that these people, even though they voted for you, will perceive you as corrupt. Okay, now TI not, not only gathered the information, but also tried to find trends and interpret it, and finally issued recommendations to the governments of the, country, of the surveyed countries. The, they issued seven recommendations, and they were, number one, to make elections more transparent. Now, speci specifically, they, 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 um, they essentially, TI tells the, the, the governments of the countries, do whatever you want. We won't tell you how to do it. Do it however you want, but achieve these results. Achieve the result of no more vote buying. Uh, make make uh, your institutions or your laws uh, so strong that they forbid or at least inhibit vote buying. Limit uh, fake news. Governments should make it so that it isn't profitable. Make the conditions so that it isn't profitable for media outlets to uh, publish fake news. And um, they encourage the governments to rely on serious investigative journalism, fact-based journalism instead of just, you know, fake news. Recommendation number number two uh, was to foster transpar transparent political financing. Now, different countries have different rules, but essentially all elections cost money. All electoral campaigns cost money. And a lot of these countries are not so transparent as how the candidates receive that money. So again, TI is encouraging the countries to do whatever you want, modify your policies, your laws, your regulation, your whatever, to make it so that electoral financing, political financing is transparent and everybody has um, knows the rules so that they have a, a level playing field. Recommendation number three is to make government processes easier. Now, if government processes, things that you obtain from your government are complicated and they are hard to do and also there's a lot of contact between the citizen and the public official that is in charge of the process, then the potential for abuse is huge and there are a lot of nooks and crannies to exploit for corruption, a lot of opportunity for corruption. So TI encourages governments to reduce the number of intermediaries and whenever possible to make it, make it, um, to allow citizens to do the processes via the internet or electronic platforms and to reduce personal contact there is much less of a chance uh, of a government official asking you or soliciting a bribe from you if you never meet her in person. Recommendation number four is to strengthen the judiciary. The judiciary, as you know, is composed by courts, uh, tribunals, judges, and everything else that functions like a court that is in the business of imparting justice, justice administering justice. And it is the perception of the, of the people polled that the judiciary is not doing enough or is not impartial. So the recommendation of TI is for the governments to strengthen policies, laws, and awareness campaigns so that the judicial institutions are exactly that, institutions. Recommendation number five is for governments to facilitate whistleblowing, uh, denouncing corruption, uh, for civil society and for NGOs. Make it easier for citizens and for citizen organizations to report corrupt acts and also to aid in protecting the whistleblowers uh, by, with, you, you know, by, by providing um, anonymous whistleblowing systems so, so as to minimize uh, retaliation from the corrupt. It's obviously much harder to report corruption if you are in fear of getting killed for it. Recommendation number six 
is extremely interesting and it's very new to this type of study. Um, Transparency International found that there is a lot of corruption that specifically harms or targets uh, as its victims women. And it, it, it encourages countries to do whatever they can to recognize and to address gender-based or gender-harming corruption. Now, to recognize and to address gender-biased corruption. You, you think of corruption and you most of the time you think of a bribe, but that bribe might, might pay off a police, a police officer or an officer of law enforcement and make her turn a blind eye to sex trafficking, prostitution, things, horrible things like that, that tend to harm uh, mostly women. Also, we, we, um, we found that sexual extortion is a new trend that is growing, unfortunately, uh, among the corrupt acts. And obviously, uh, if you are a woman, you are in a more vulnerable position to be exploited uh, or to be a victim of sexual extortion. So TI, uh, again, encourages countries to recognize gender-biased corruption and to address it with laws and policies. And recommendation number seven is to implement the Lima Agreement. Now, as you know, the Lima Agreement, you might remember it from the Venezuela, Guaido, and Maduro scandal, but it is an agreement uh, reached by several countries of the region, excluding Mexico, to um, protect and foster democracy in Latin America. And of course, democracy, uh, if democracy is plagued with, with vote buying and um, obscure political financing rules, then democracy cannot grow. So the seventh recommendation by TI is to for countries to do whatever they can to make sure that they implement the Lima Agreement, except again for Mexico. Okay, let's move on to the case. Um, as you know, TI, Transparency International, turned 25 this year and they issued a list of the 25, the 25 most iconic corruption cases and now we, give, we are doing a rundown, a rundown of that list. Today we have the case of the Russian laundromat. This is egregious and huge and scandalous for many reasons. Essentially, uh, the Russian laundromat is a corruption scandal that involves uh, shell companies from the UK, from... Uh, Ah, from Latvia and some public officials from Moldova uh, that were involved in siphoning around 20, 20 billion dollars of Russian public money to private hands. Now, the way this worked is um, this scandal involved 5,000 different companies, shell companies, which we've discussed in other typologies, uh, using bank accounts from 700 different banks from 90, uh, uh, from over 90 countries, totaling uh, embezzlement and graft of $20 billion. Now, this is kind of complex. I'll try to make it as easy as possible. The way this worked is you had company A in Russia that lent money to company B, also in Russia. Now, that loan was guaranteed by company C in Moldova. A guarantee is essentially, if I am unable to pay, then you step into my shoes and you pay what I owe. Okay, now, what happened here was that the company in Russia, company A, loaned money to company B, and company C was the guarantor or, you know, uh, yeah, was the guarantor for that loan. So company A decided not to pay. This loan never, exi never existed, by the way. Company A decides not to pay, and obviously company B wants to collect from company A in Russia. But because the guarantor is a company from Moldova, they have to sue that company, company C, uh, in uh, the Moldovian judiciary, in Moldovian courts. Now, company C and company A do this tricky thing where they pay bribes to judges in Moldova to expedite the proceedings and to rule against them, which is kind of weird. Not against the person suing, but against the person, be the company being sued. And therefore, um, the courts in Moldova issue a ruling, a sentence. That sentence has legal force in Russia. So that sentence is taken to Russia against company A. And now company A has to pay the money to company B. Money which never existed. 
and that makes it easier that gives you a, a, a reliable paper trail and a reason for money to be flowing out of Russia into the different the different countries now again this flowed into banks from uh, into many many companies from the UK and from Latvia and to banks in the UK and Latvia and several other countries now what they do here is as we will talk in a bit they layered the operations and instead of making one one big money transfer or one big wire transfer they split the money into different smaller amounts and send it to different companies and those different companies send the money to you know sometimes themselves or sometimes other companies and they do this many many times over so that it becomes really really hard to trace the original large amount to the or to the final destination uh, of the money the scandal broke mainly because of a piece of news of, of investigative journalism and to this date it has not been satisfactorily resolved but as always we will keep you posted okay let's move on to the typology today we, today we get to talk about legal vehicles now we've talked about shell companies shell corporations uh, and in another episode and they are essentially companies that you set up uh, and they do really nothing you only set them up on paper and you pretend to have operations so that you can you know use them for corruption money laundering and all the all the good stuff okay now we will talk about legal vehicles now legal vehicles is a broader category so if you have shell companies the universe of shell companies is contained within the universe of legal vehicles now what are legal vehicles suppose you do business with someone else one human with another human uh, it's just you know two people doing operations doing business those are what we know as natural persons now whenever whenever anything other than a natural person other than a human being is doing the legal acts we we think of them as legal entities or sometimes legal vehicles now this these might be companies but they also could be trusts uh contracts sometimes um, in, in different other legal fictions a legal, fi a legal fiction is something that we pretend is true only for the purposes of the law like companies now why is this an issue because if i i pay a bribe and that bribe comes from my account then it is is coming from the account of michelle and moving into the account of you know someone else and then you know who who the people involved are and even though it might move from that account to the account of another person and so on and so forth maybe five times over you know where the money originated and where the money wound up however when you use legal entities or legal vehicles it's kind of harder harder because you don't know number one uh, because you don't know who the human behind the corporation behind these legal entities is most countries most serious countries require that whenever you form a legal vehicle the um, there has to be a hard connection or a hard nexus uh, between the company and who owns it so that we know who is the human or who are the humans behind the companies however a lot of countries don't do this uh, counting them including among them the US and the, the United States uh, state of Delaware which has very loose regulation the problem with that is that if you don't know if you're not entirely sure of who is the person behind the company then you know you don't know who the human doing the transactions is and that lends itself to shady operations one of the ways in which those operations facilitate crime is by money laundering so let's say that I'm taking money out of my account and moving it into the account of a company and I might not be appear as the, I, I might not appear as the shareholder in the records of the company because the country where I formed it, like Panama, doesn't uh, doesn't require that the name is uh, the name of the human is registered, right? The name of the human owner is registered uh, with the government. If that corporation in turn do, does business with uh, another company that has a Swiss bank account or a bank account in Sudan or in Liechtenstein or in Austria mm -hmm. and that in, in turn that the money moves from that bank account to another company in Mexico and so on and so forth it's very hard to trace the money also the amounts don't uh, don't always match so you might take ten thousand dollars from the original amount and move it via two or split it between among two or three transfers and then split those three transfers 
two or three times and you do that enough enough times and the authorities really cannot follow the money okay awesome thank you for being with us this was the wife of caesar again my name is michelle bien or michelle bien either is fine and i'll leave you as always with this please blow the whistle every act of corruption should be denounced but do so safely if you're not sure whether or not what you're looking at is corruption or you're not sure that you are physically safe don't do anything reach out to someone who might help you feel free to reach out to us at info at striner.mx and we will be glad to assist you but above all please stay safe again this was the wife of caesar thank you for joining us and have a happy monday